warning, some viewers may find this content disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Jessica Jones, a.k.a. the Cryptid Huntress. It is always absolutely legendary to see you venture back into the fox den and awaken me from my slumber for another Dogman expedition. Much better, absolutely delicious. And now that I am recharged, revamped, and ready to go, it is time for the cryptid huntress and myself to take a walk into the darkness. <laughs> Creatures of the night, yes. Welcome back once again to another episode of Midnight Lycanthropy here on Star Fox Radio. The Cryptid Huntress, who just hit 10,000 subs, so we know she's busy. But guess what? She still comes and hangs out with us bi-weekly. So yes, make sure to go over there and check out Jessica's content and give her a subscription because she does stay stacked up with things but as stated still comes and hangs out with us so how are you doing tonight jessica hey i'm excellent excellent just uh staying busy and uh thank you for the congrats on those ten thousand subs there that's uh really wild um it's a big milestone and uh, i'm super excited and i want to give a thank you to everybody who's listening who has subscribed to my channel and uh, watches my shows it's still shocking sometimes it was a little berserk, let's just say, <laughs> with that, right? <laughs> no, that's totally excellent. And, I mean, honestly, in the grand scheme of things, even though 10K is great, you're still technically a small channel. I mean, you still have so much, like, growth to go, you know what I mean? So it's just, like, the beginning of your voyage, potentially, so it's excellent. For sure, for sure, yeah. It's a, the stepping stone, right? Um, and so, uh, but yeah, it's, it's taken a while to get here, but, um, but here we are. So, uh, and it's because we're talking about some really cool stuff. Uh, you know, the werewolves, the dogmen, it's because I'm having great people on my channel too, like yourself. Uh, so it makes all the difference, uh, bringing wonderful people from, you know, the North American Dogman project on and all the different communities, um, in the cryptid world. That's what's making the channel grow right there. Appreciate that kudos right there, and that is just one of the many reasons why you're one of my favorite people, and I appreciate that, and I always try to make sure to support everybody else back that supports myself, and even though, like you said, I'm super busy, but I always got time to, you know, pop in and definitely make sure to subscribe to people that are, like I said, very good researchers and friends of mine and such, so I do appreciate you. Well, I appreciate you too, always. I uh, always, always carve out some time to come over here and hang out with you. I know, it's week. excellent. I feel so special. <laughs> Tonight, you had an amazing topic that you had been already talking about on your thread. And ironically, before I even knew that, until you had told me that, I was just recording with Ernie, the Squatch Whisperer, and I had made a reference 
to him about potentially some thoughts of why people would have been like, oh, wow, that's a crazy looking werewolf. And then you brought up the topic as to what you had been speaking about. And I was like, wow, isn't that ironic? So I'm going to toss you the mic here, my friend. And yes, let's do this. Yeah, well, I got interested in looking into Viking werewolves. And of course, that took me into the whole berserker topic as well. So I figured let's talk about that a little bit tonight because, you know, I have Viking heritage. I grew up, my dad always told me that we come from Welsh Vikings. (laughs) Okay. And, uh, and I had just done a show uh, about, I guess sometime last week where we were talking about the moon eyed people throughout the Southeastern United States. And I started learning history that's not taught in our history books, okay? Because, you know, we're always taught that Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 and came over here and discovered America, right? Um, Well, actually, (laughs) history is not what we're taught. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that's been left out. And part of that, something that I was not taught before was about um, a, a, a Welsh prince, actually, in 1170, sailed over here to what we know now as America, North America, He landed in Alabama, what is now Alabama, and uh, started trekking up north and ran into, I guess, the moon-eyed people. Okay, and so that we, um, I got in, I got into that that topic, and uh, and and it took me down a rabbit hole. Okay, a real rabbit hole um, of all the different things that we've been taught in our history here, just in America alone, Uh, and the different ancient civilizations that we've had here and all the ancient artifacts that we found here, uh, including a lot of Viking relics, um, Viking, I mean, for centuries and centuries ago, uh, ancient Egyptians, uh, you know, even like gigantic Buddhists and things like in the Grand Canyon. Okay. So big statues and stuff uh, that are more of, you know, uh, Indian or Asian um, background. Viking werewolves. Let's see. Uh, when I was researching Viking werewolves, like I said, uh, it just naturally flowed into the berserkers. Okay, because if you go into Viking history, some of the oldest known stories that have been passed down, the oldest known story that is of Viking tradition is about two men, a son and a father, who became werewolves. Okay, now this is actually from, I think it's called the Volsunga Saga of 1270. Uh, Vi- there's a story called, uh, it's about two men of, their names are Sigmunder and Sinvotli. Sinvotli, I think is how you say his, last, his name. And, um, and these, are, these are two uh, thieves, all right? A father and son team that are thieves. Uh, they went into the home of two wealthy men and they found some wolf skins, uh, some wolf fur that it was like pelts that were hanging on the wall and they stole these two wolf pelts. Well, when they put them on, you'll never believe what happened. They transformed into werewolves. Now they, it it, it was fun and games. It was all wonderful. They were, they transformed and they started frolicking around and it was fun and games until things started getting violent. And the father ended up biting his son's neck as they were turned into werewolves. Well, the son almost bled and the father ended up using some kind of magic herb to heal it. And after 11 days, the two men actually turned back into human form. So 11 days, that's a long time to be werewolves, okay? Um, And and going on rampages and probably unaliving people and stuff um, for all I know, but they, it was very violent. Uh, But, as soon as they turned back into human form after 11 days, they were so traumatized by the event uh, of what had happened to them that they burned the pelts. Now, like I said, this is the oldest, most popular tale that the Vikings have passed down, according to a lot of the literature in the history of the Vikings. And it's really interesting, too, that about there's at least 50, OK, 50 known stories uh, that were told amongst the Vikings. Uh, about werewolves and wolves, you know, the wolf is revered in Viking lore and in history and the Viking warriors would oftentimes embody the wolf. And, you know, the story about uh, Sigmunder and uh, Sinvolti, 
is that's a traditional story where these two men actually did turn into werewolves. And those stories were pretty common, especially after this, that story uh, first was written and started being told. Now, was that based on a true story? Mm, I don't know. We'll never know, right? Uh, we're not sure. But something that is definite is that there are a lot of werewolf stories. The Viking warriors back then, they had warriors, like their fiercest warriors, would do something called berserking. <laughs> I was going to figure out how to say it. Berserking, they were called berserkers or berserkers. And that's where they would um, pretty much go into a rage. Okay, like these these men would put on the pelt of an animal, much like those two, the father and the son duo did. They would take the pelt of an animal like a wolf or a bear, uh, sometimes even a boar's head, like a, 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 a boar, like a, a wild hog. Um, they would put the pelt on over their head and through rituals, through ceremony, through dance, through uh, dancing around a fire and potentially taking psychedelics of some sort, as in, you know, mushrooms or some kind of plant life, some kind of concoctions, uh, they would go into like a trance pretty much and uh, just start raging uh, on their way into battle. And they would go in just going berserk. <laughs> okay, that's where we get the term berserk from. Uh, is from these men, uh, and oftentimes they didn't even wear clothes. They would go barefoot, no clothes on whatsoever, just the pelt of an animal, because what they would do, they would transform into that animal. And now I don't mean they their bodies would actually transform, but they would take on the characteristics of the animal that they were wearing, much like the skinwalker that you and I have talked about before. That is definitely some gnarly, very interesting stuff right there for sure. And when it comes to historical aspects, I've always been a nerd, so I definitely like to learn. And I'd heard some of the Viking berserker stories. And now that you had been able to speak about that, I can bring up what I had told Ernie without spoiling uh, what it is we were going to speak about. I had mentioned to him. Yeah. That in theory, right, think if fear is involved, right, and you are a non-aggressive group of people or just people in general that aren't capable of defending off somebody such as berserkers or – and you've never even seen them before, right, and they come in with all the pain on the wolf skin just all completely out of their mind on substances, hallucinogenics, whatever, right – and just biting people, howling, just acting gnarly. Would that not look like werewolves for sure? Yeah, totally. And and here's the thing. Yeah, they would absolutely growl and they would bite and uh, they would attack in a frenzy. And uh, they were very much like an actual wolf. Um, and so and the victims in these, you know, they, the Vikings would go on raids. It wasn't just in battle uh, on the battlefield. They would go into raids and and you know, plunder and pillage all sorts of villages. And they would go into a berserker mode when they would go and raid villages. And so uh, the people who were their victims would describe them as being werewolves. And something that I found really cool is that uh, the wolf was a symbol of Viking society. And um, they based their communities, their way of living, their way of protecting the herd and all that kind of stuff uh, based on like how the wolves do. Okay. And uh, the, the way of the ways of the wolves and even being exiled, you know, because the wolves actually, if you, if a wolf pack exiles, one of their members, that's pretty much a death sentence. They don't want to be, uh, that was the worst punishment. And uh, because it meant uh, societal literal death, uh, but, but, you know, the wolf pack, let's just say is just a symbol of social order. Uh, for the Vikings. And um, and so, you know, going back to the werewolf aspect, though, you know, I, I didn't find any kind of actual accounts of men turning into actual werewolves. It was mostly berserkers, right? But where's the line, right? Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, our history is not what we're taught. And I'm learning new things every day. And wouldn't it be interesting if there were yeah. wolves, because they are in all these stories, a lot of these stories that the Vikings passed down, what if there were actual werewolves fighting amongst the warriors that were in berserker mode? 
that would be cool, right? Definitely be some gnarly stuff right there for sure. And as you were saying that, I can't remember which underworld it was where all the vampires are in the village on the horses and the werewolves just start transforming and like busting out of like the old cabins and huts and starting to battle out. And I was just for some reason picturing all that as you had stated. And it's super interesting because I do know a ton of cultures have different variants and terminologies for skinwalkers and wearing the pelt to something is the way to do it and doing heinous things well i mean slaughtering people would be pretty heinous and who knows what you know dark magics so yeah that actually kind of lines up pretty well because ryan tremblay and i and other people were talking about how ton of historical aspects for dogman ton of historical aspects for skinwalkers but when it comes to like werewolves there is that's where the term comes from but we're thinking maybe were they actually, when they said werewolves, seeing dogmen back then? Like, for example, the Ruguru supposedly came over, right, with the culture of the French down in Louisiana. And a lot of times when people are seeing these things at that night, okay, well, we do know dogmen are out at night. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying that it isn't or it wasn't something that transformed, but could that not have just been a dogman as well? It totally could have been a dogman. You know, and we say that dogmen are you know, a lot of them have probably been here since the beginning of time. You know, we have these maps like the Piri Reese map where they show civilizations of dog headed men throughout time, you know, in the medieval times, actually. You know, we talk about you and I've talked about how King Arthur fought an entire army of dog headed men at some point. Right. Um, it's a. Uh, it's just it, historically there have been dog headed men throughout history. And so I, I have no doubt that it, there is a possibility there could have been dog men fighting amongst the Vikings. Maybe the Vikings fought the dog men. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's such a cool topic. And I think that it deserves a lot more research and, uh, and for us to talk about it some more uh, and to really dig into that, because we have to start questioning all the history that we've been taught. And um, when we're looking at maps of dog-headed men in the medieval times uh why wouldn't why wouldn't they have been with the vikings that's all or fighting the vikings in some way i mean the vikings went on a, a spree and took over you know all sorts of lands right <laughs> they traveled far and wide and even some of the vikings had uh wolves carved on their ships wolves heads everywhere the wolf was their symbol super interesting right there and i believe you might be referring to a relic I guess terminology mm -hmm. it was like their relic i know exactly what you were talking about and i don't know if you've ever had a chance to speak to william white he's a part of our science team he's actually our geologist and he's got a lot of other specialties that in education wise he's a scientist but he has a really great yes i'm going to say theory not even hypothesis because i feel like we've been able to get it up to theory where he thinks at a point in time the Sinocephalized culture kind of collapsed, like you know how throughout history great civilizations fall, whether it's the Egyptians, the Romans, yet there are still parts of these civilizations that lived on. Well, he seems to think that there would still be numbers, but obviously dwindled numbers of the Sinocephali that are still out there. And again, when people say, they saw a canine creature wearing clothes. Well, the Sinocephali were reported to wear furs and also human-like clothing. So that's why I had mentioned just because someone saw something that was canine with clothing on doesn't mean it had to have been in human form first. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, because if we had dog-headed men, that doesn't mean they were, you know, we don't we can't even see that they were actually like half human, half dog. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that they were their own race of people or beings let's just say Agreed. beings <laughs> humanoids right uh, bipedal humanoids uh, because you know the stories go back saying that they actually used to eat humans <laughs> okay so they would actually eat them and if when they would fight with another uh when they would fight against humans uh they didn't go after them and eat them right off you know just just to eat them uh but the prisoners of war were eaten by the dog-headed men according to legend and lore so um who knows? I think that I think that it was more widely accepted back then uh, to I mean, it was just part of part of uh, just part of society. 
having uh, dog headed men and blimmies and stuff mm-hmm. like that, uh, that we don't, we just, we just don't have that today. And giants too. Giants. I love talking about giants. Exactly. 100%. And uh, William again had mentioned Jason and the Argonauts had a battle with anocephali like type individuals and every prevalent culture in the world has references to dog headed people. And that's where I think people in general have a misunderstanding of this being a modern day thing. It is not. The Aztecs have depictions of well, it looks to be Sinocephali wearing Aztec-like clothing, okay? The Egyptians, Anubis. You have the Sinocephali with Herodotus and Alexander the Great, okay? You have the sub-tribe of them in India, where the continent of India is now talking about this, okay? Then you have the North Americans, the indigenous cultures here speaking about them, okay? Then you have the indigenous cultures up in the Yukon territories, speaking about things like the saber wolf, etc. So you have all these cultures that had no connection at points in time making references to this. And as far as I know, that's pretty old school. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Did the Egyptians and Aztecs make references to it, Sasquatch and such? And if they did, awesome. But if not, then I mean, look at this. That's like super old school dogman depictions. Yeah, they, to my knowledge, I don't think that there's a lot of acknowledgement of Sasquatch with the Egyptians. Uh, I do know that their art does depict giants, <laughs> okay, giants and little people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, but as far as that goes, no, I mean, but there were a whole lot of like chimera like beings depicted in Egyptian, you know, as Egyptian gods, uh, all the animal headed mm-hmm. humans humanoids and stuff so um of course we're taught this is all like mythology it's all about the gods and goddesses but i mean could they have actually existed so that's the question super interesting again and no it's just because i feel like for some reason dog men even though there's a ton of credible evidence just it fell through the hands of time meaning we as humans purposely pick and choose what it is we want to acknowledge meaning there are people throughout history that have done very shady and questionable things yet for some reason it's overlooked okay and mm-hmm. for some reason that's just how we are as people we just like to overlook things but i like to bring that up because i think there's just as much if not more evidence supporting dog-headed people than there is Sasquatch and I believe in Sasquatch, but I'm just saying when people say, hey, there's no historical reference until Steve Cook dropped that song. That's false. I mean, there was an encounter up here in Maine that was prior to the Steve Cook 1887 logger account. OK, so, I mean, this is something that is very historical based, but yet people just laugh. And especially when I tried to present something like a little while ago, a cryptozoology group invited me. So I posted something. And this guy starts trolling, but I'm not really about trolling, so I didn't respond. But he just said something about how there's no scientific evidence for dogman and blah, 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 blah. I just literally just typed this whole thing. And I just ended up like leaving the group because, like I said, I'm not about that life. But it's just Mm -hmm. ironic to me and amusing that someone such as that individual can believe in, say, something like Loch Ness Monster or Mothman. But yeah, this whole conversation you and I have been speaking about is evidence supporting dog headed people. Yeah, apparently it's a joke to talk about the topic. Yeah, I mean, when you have it, when you have them depicted on a map, uh, that just shows you that people drew and depicted what they saw. Okay, even on um, even on petroglyphs and on uh, pictographs and on you know rock wa- rock walls and stuff, um, it's uh, or cave walls, I guess. People drew drew what they saw and they were drawing the cynocephali, right? Cynocephalus and just uh, dog headed men. And um, so I would I think that they existed, OK, because we're getting sightings to this day. I mean, you know, you know better than anybody with the North American Dogman Project. You got <laughs> you guys get um, get reports all the time, as do I uh, here in Georgia. So uh, we're, we're getting reports. Uh, we're getting more reports than ever. And there's something to it. 
Very true, and I appreciate the kudos right there. And actually, speaking of maps, check your phone. I just texted you some maps that were actually just recently submitted to Jody Cook and ourselves over here at the North American Dogman Project. They're old school Antarctica maps, and look at what that depicts right there by early settlers, eh? Oh, very cool. Well, I don't have my phone with me right now. My son has oh, it. I'll check okay. it after we get done tonight. Well, for sure. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll give you a description. On Basically, long story short is, yeah, there are three segments of an old Antarctica map. And on the map, there are depictions in certain areas of basically those like dog people, which is pretty interesting. Wow, that's, fan that's fantastic, actually. I can't wait to see that map. Um, you know, they say Antarctica was not always covered in ice. <laughs> you know, and if you are a conspiracy theorist, uh, and and it's it's not even a, a theorist; it's a realist, in my opinion. Um, some say that there is an ice wall around Antarctica, and uh, if you go beyond that ice wall, there are lands like beautiful continents and stuff. Uh, some people say that's even what we consider to be outer space. I mean, there's all sorts of rabbit holes you can go down with all of that. Uh, but you know, and if you look into Antarctica. Back in the 19, I think it was the 40s or 50s with Admiral Byrd and uh, Operation uh, High Jump that happened there. Uh, his diaries claim that over Antarctica, there's an entrance to inner earth and he was taken into inner earth to hollow earth. It's called Argatha. And uh, there's all sorts of incredible beings living down there. And I, apparently they're still down there today. So why wouldn't there be dog headed men down there still? Super bizarre for sure. And no, I just thought you would find that to be interesting because obviously the quality of the map isn't the best because I mean I don't think the point of the individual making it was trying to be artistic they were just trying to document the area you know so yeah it's really intriguing just because as stated there's just so many historical references and so much that is occurring so I've just always found it to be amusing when people will just kind of turn the blind eye as stated there is just like you had mentioned and just in general this whole conversation about how the historical references and i just think that it shouldn't be overlooked because like our science team says you have good science and you have bad science meaning bad science is when you try to fit everything into the narrative that you would like meaning that even though this could be screaming hey but you might not like that so you do it like this but a good scientist might have a hypothesis or theory that they don't want to be true but the evidence might be pointing in that direction so it is just super important to uh, gather the proper information and get it out and that's what's really excellent about our science team is that they're individuals that are highly educated that have actually been able to be reached and provided information that they are baffled by Oh, yeah, it's super important and it's so awesome that you guys have a research team and a science team and all the different teams, historical team and all that, uh, because it all makes uh, it all comes together. It brings all the information that you guys get together and uh, you're going to start connecting all those dots. That's my favorite thing to do with all of these shows that I do and all the research that I do, all this boots on the ground stuff I'm doing. Uh, we're, we're connecting dots and, uh, and sharing the information that we have. And it's, it's the only way we're going to start figuring a lot of this stuff out. And history has been hidden from us. A lot of a lot of real world history has been skewed in some way. And uh, we, we're the disclosure to all this. OK, and it's us uh, piecing these stories together and taking oral traditions and oral stories that are passed down from, you know, uh, the indigenous people even here in North America uh, to Vikings, okay, Viking lore. Uh, we we need to start looking uh, very closely into legends and lore of all cultures, and seeing where uh, the dog-headed men fit in, and the, the Sasquatch, and the moon-eyed people, even uh, all these all these different beings and these races of extraordinary beings. OK, that uh, probably don't even exist anymore here, or they if they do, and I'm not saying they don't exist, like. They do exist, I think, but not, uh, you know, here out in the open uh, like the dog headed men once did, uh, as shown on the maps from the old world evil mm -hmm. times. Great stuff right there, my friend, and couldn't agree more. Well, thank you so much for popping in, like always, to come hang out with us, because I do know and 
everyone should know that you are quite a busy individual. So it is always a privilege to try to figure out what's going on with this topic. And next time we link up for sure, you definitely need to update me on how your next adventure is going. And if you do have any new or really cool dogman concepts or evidence to speak about for sure. I will. I will. I'm heading into the woods again this weekend. I'm headed to East Tennessee. And you know what happens in East Tennessee? Lots of dogman reports and weird cryptid sightings. So I'm going to be out there with the crew coming up in about two days. So I'll give you an update next time we talk. Thank you for everyone who once again stopped by tonight for this episode of Midnight Lycanthropy here on Star Fox Radio. If you do enjoy my content, please like, subscribe, and share it. Feed the algorithm, and I will see you on the next one.